This is the Pro Audio Suite Podcast. Quick Bites. Welcome to another Pro Audio Suite Quick Bite. Thanks to Harlan Hogan's VoiceOver Essentials and Rode Microphones. Now, this week we had a question. It came from a UK voice talent and audio engineer, a guy called Colin Day. He dropped us a line saying he's having issues EQing and recording female vocals or female voices. We sort of scratched our heads for a bit and thought, well, is there a problem? But it wasn't the first time we've had a a note about recording females. Now, we've got uh, MPA from Waves with us again this week. I don't know who wants to start, but do you see an issue with female voices? I don't really see an issue. I mean, I think a lot of the time, I mean, this question is kind of loaded in a way and Colin, I'm, uh, Colin I'm, I'm not blaming you for the question. It's a great question, but it needs to be a bit more specific because every single vocalist I've ever dealt with, whether it was, um, you know, uh, uh, a singer in Brisbane or whether it was Alicia Keys in Long Island, every single one is different and the microphone is different. Um, the microphone technique is probably one of the biggest deals for me. Because the microphone technique, and I know this sounds really weird coming from a guy uh, who is a mix engineer and also works for a plug-in company, the mic technique gives me the information I need to decide what kind of processing I need to print on it on the way in so I can make better decisions on the way out. One of the things that I don't want to do, though, especially when I'm working with a really dynamic female vocal is ever use the words fix it in the mix. I want to be able to decide up front how I'm going to deal with that. If I need to put a bit of compression on it on the way in or uh, a bit of a high pass, do it. You've got to make a decision on the way in as far as I'm concerned. George? Well, yeah, I'm I'm wondering if this is about frequency content um, slash the way this person monitors audio the monitors he uses or the headphones he uses, on and on, that maybe makes some frequency content more difficult to monitor or stand out. Um, And and, and also, is it it the, you know, the other question is, if you're having problems recording a specific kind of vocalist, then the, the question that I also raise is, what other signals are coming in and how are those being monitored? And... How is the vocalist dealing with that? Are they hearing it properly? Because if the vocalist isn't hearing things properly in their headphones, then I don't want to use a too technical term, but their performance is going to be a bit shit. Don't get too technical, Gomez. You'll confuse people. Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, shit. uh, That's an acronym. Um, uh, (laughs) This is a voiceover guy. I've seen his studio. It's a pretty good setup. Um, He's got his and hers matching U87s and a truckload of outboard gear. I'm kind of looking at, you know, the, when I've, from what I've seen from the pictures of his studio, I'm wondering if it's something to do with his room. Well, it could be the room. It could be that the U87 would not be the first mic I grabbed to record a female voice. Maybe over, he should use uh, his U87 on her. Uh, yes, that's right. <laughs> I, I got to be honest. Um, I don't think the, for voiceover a U87 for a female voiceover. I can't. I don't think a U87 would be the first one I'd reach for. To be honest, I don't know. It you certainly wouldn't be the first one I would reach for. Yeah, I, I was going to say like typically for me like the one thing with female voiceover is. Like sometimes there's a little bit more of an S problem, or it's a little bit more sharp. Like it's not that it's a problem. Yeah, sometimes but it, if if yeah, clipping clipping can is is like if you really want to make sure the mic choice and their mic technique and their placement and also the acoustics around them, even if it's just a curtain, is right because otherwise you are potentially going to get a bit of uh, kind of like soft signal clip. Um, so yeah, it could be it could be a room thing. Two words: reference material. I want to yeah. hear what else was going yeah. on. Maybe Colin should yeah, send us sure. some stuff to have a listen to. Totally. Yeah, because I did yeah. notice from the pictures I saw, they've actually got. It looks like a. It looks like a, a, a sort of nineteen fifties bar where they're set up. So there's quite a lot of hard service around the area. I don't know whether that would have been an issue. Maybe. Sure. Yeah, I mean, if you're getting some standing waves from the desk and the reflections that are resonating at the right, wrong frequencies, mm-hmm. yep. uh, that's going to build up and create some high, right. harsh, um, up, you know, mid-range. It doesn't really matter to me what you're mixing and what you're recording, but one of the things that acoustically every person needs to do, whether it's theater curtains or foam, whatever else, is definitely do some kind of bass trap treatments. 
If you're having problems recording something like a female vocal, apart from the microphone choice, if your room has uh, so much rebound that you're you're not really hearing things properly, then there's going to be problems. I don't care about other frequencies as long as the bass traps are dealt with in in one way or another. I think that that goes a long way to helping. Yeah, and we don't know the monitoring environment and how well it's right. tuned, and and we there's so many variables. I mean, like so I mean, many. we don't know if this is an input or output issue. Right? Maybe it's like you know bad decisions made because of bad output. Right. But but you would think that if that was the case, then he would have trouble with other things that he's recording, you know, not just. So let know. let me use an example. So when I when I first moved into this house, the first thing I did because my priorities were right was I started building out the studio. Um, <laughs> now, when I when I put an RCA microphone in the middle of the room in the mix position, and I recorded uh, tone, and I recorded a microphone, etc., and then I listened to it back, the first thing I heard was this almighty bass boom in the microphone coming back that I wasn't hearing when I was listening through my pair of monitors. So it was like, okay, so there's a room issue there. Now, if that's the problem with him, then that's going to be easy. It's just going to be a case of working out what part of his room is giving him those rebound issues and dealing with it. Sometimes people can actually put in too much acoustic material like carpets and couches and things and make it too dead. But I find that generally speaking, if your speaker placement is right and the microphone is in a place where it's like, say, for example, it's not right next to a window on a tiled floor with a... (laughs) Um, a a sink next to it or something, then you should be okay. But I mean, that's the first thing I would be looking at is like, if he's getting rebound and boominess in a vocal when he's hearing it back, then we know that it's the source material. Yeah, I mean, you also have to look out for comb filtering from early reflections, and that's where we get into the the mic being too close to a surface that doesn't look like it's a hard surface, but acoustically it actually is. Because it only has like a quarter of an inch of carpet or a one inch layer of foam. And so it's still allowing everything between 100 and 1,000 hertz to keep bouncing around, but it doesn't look like it um, because it's covered in foam. I get that a lot. You know, just people don't realize that that one inch layer of foam is not a uh, panacea for acoustic treatment. No, I think yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, a lot of the times, it, the if you, all you have to do is jump on eBay or Amazon and you see, you know, thousands of results for acoustical treatment, and uh, I, I wouldn't park my ass on them, let alone stick them in a corner of a room. I mean, in this room here, and again, I'm looking at a camera, but you can't damn well see it. Um, one of the things that I had to do with my windows was use theater curtains double layer theater curtains to get rid of a certain frequency on those windows. And then uh, I came to a point where I realized, okay, it's too dead. And I actually fixed it by shortening the curtains and taking them off the ground a bit until it was right. So sometimes you can you know, think outside the box to mix in the box, but also work out if the frequency problem is actually coming through the microphone or whether... His headphones and his speakers are not, uh, you know, relaying the signal properly. There's also another thing that uh, a lot of people do now, including myself, is read off an iPad as opposed to a script. A little bit of a hard surface there. Exactly. So that could be an issue as well. I'm assuming they they use iPads. I think from memory in their video they were using iPads. There's so many. I'd never thought. I'd never actually thought about that. Actually. Probably because the last time, uh, every time I read a script now, it's for a, it's for a, a tutorial video on waves, and it's uh, it's on a forty inch monitor on one of my walls. So, <laughs> at twenty eight font. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> As I said, I'm old. The smaller the room, the more the the classic acoustical design formulas just disappear. In fact, if you read all the books on acoustic design for studios and and, and rooms. They never really address how to acoustically tune a three by five box. Yeah, they ba- basically tell you don't do that. Yeah, they basically say that. Well, that's like a, you know that's like zero over that's like one over zero, you know, in math. You know, I so think- that's why I got to somehow BS my way into speaking to NAB on the topic one time. They actually uh, they actually approved the, me to speak on this. I have zero accreditation. 
but it's I was funny you, them, you, right? you did you did that at NAB and I did it at Infocom and it's <laughs> yeah. like and I was like wait you want me to talk on what you, you realize I work for a plug-in company right right um, so I, I think and the, the, another point on this one seeming as you guys brought it up is it doesn't matter how impressive the gear is if it's a bad acoustic scenario, even when it comes down to mic choice. I mean, the U87, yeah, you know, the, the microphone doesn't sound like the right one. But if there's a bunch of rebound stuff, it doesn't matter whether you're monitoring on PMCs uh, and using $10,000 microphones, it's not going to make a difference. Right. So well, I've got one question. It's sort of sort of a bit of a sidetrack from what we're talking about as far as female voices are concerned, but we did touch on booths and something three by five being not right, basically. So what is the smallest space you could actually use professionally in, in a, as a booth? Is there any a, math that goes with it? Well, it's supposed to technically there, there there's two things about it. Number one, I think the if if you could get down to 20 hertz, what is it like a 20 foot wall is is usually what's recommended in a control room to have like response down to the lowest frequency. I think it's about 20 it's, foot. It's ver- yeah, it's about it's very close to that, yeah. Yeah, 20 foot. So I don't think that you can make a booth like you, you know you can bass trap it and try to minimize all the high frequency and the bass traps or bass frequencies that might might bounce back, but inevitably the booth is going to have a resonant frequency. And if you make it big enough, the resonant frequency is low and out of the way. H- how does Bose make a speaker sound big without making it big? <laughs> well, I mean, I think one of the things with a company like Bose is it's not really what I would call a true sound. Correct. Um, it's right. It's so it's all ported uh, and tubed and wave guided to make it sound like it's more air and more volume than it really is. Exactly, um, which doesn't really help anybody in the audio world when it comes to recording and mixing because it it doesn't give you an honest uh, reference. Right, and that's um, what the bass trap does. It sort yeah. of makes it seem like the room is reacting less to bass than than it is. Like like a big room would react less to. I think one of the days. easiest ways I've ever dealt with a room when I've come when I've had to deal with rooms that were not designed to be recorded in is have a microphone uh, and a set of speakers and have a tone generator and have uh, like some, something like a ten band EQ or an F six with an RTA, so I can actually see the frequency of what's happening through the microphone with the noise generated back through the speakers, and literally I have moved furniture or moved different pieces of foam around until I've got a response in that room that's as close to to what I'm going to get in the time that I've got. I think I think people think, oh, you know, I need a specific kind of software to tune my room. It's like, no, you don't. You need a microphone and you need an EQ with a decent meter so that you can actually get an idea of what's happening in your room. If you've got too much bass, then keep on looking at that signal and move things around in the room or add things that have more density so that you can actually get a, an idea of what the room's reaction to your microphone and your sound is. Um, it's it's actually simpler than a lot of people want to make it, and it's but, certainly but, not but something that I. You're saying EQ it out, like like how does Andrew make a three by five booth sound not like a three by five booth, and find the frequency spots and EQ them. I'm out, not saying EQing. I'm not saying like. EQ it out. I'm saying keep that microphone open while you're looking at it and adjust what's in the room that's giving the reactions that it is, so that you get the best curve that you can. To start with, I see. But so you don't have to EQ it out. Well, Andrew, the good news is that in a three by five room, there's not going to be a lot of choices for stuff to move around. <laughs> no, and <laughs> it's right. gonna it's gonna sound muffly as shit. Whatever you do, yeah. Um, yeah, the first thing is move the back wall twenty feet away. Exactly. If you have, 20 I mean, this feet is the, the, there's one. Of the, <laughs> this is again one of the reasons why studios like Blackbird in Nashville have ceilings that are adjustable heights. It's like, you know, some of those rooms, like their drum rooms, are freaking tiny, but they can adjust one wall or they can adjust the ceiling because it makes such a difference. Well, and one thing is like, I mean, certainly if you have the option, if it's not a cube, getting those walls to not be parallel and within like, you know, 11 degrees or more, I think will 
quickly begin to help remove some of the resonant frequencies that 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 exist, like you know, like or shorten them at least. Um, they won't have quite the same ringingness if if you can eliminate some of the parallelness of the room. But is that an option for you, or is you, you're you're just talking about a a booth that's like you know a cube? No, no I just wondered if there or, was a, a sort of a mathematical equation that uh, dictates how there's the ratios. Size. Yeah, with yeah, control rooms, ratios. with control um, rooms, there's definitely ratios. I forget what exactly it is, but the side walls to the length of the room, there's different ratios that you want to go for. Um, but with a booth, I forget is what there, they are. Is, are there ratios for a booth? I would say that the same thing happens because the control room, you want it to be neutral in certain ways, and you basically are hoping that your booth is neutral. So probably the same ratios work. I would see no reason why they wouldn't. Do you yeah. do you know where to find those ratios, Gomez? Right. No, uh, I mean I I remember that somebody once told me that a five by six vocal booth is fine, but it ain't going any bigger than that's not really going to help you. But at the same point, it's like uh, you know three foot by five foot. Um, I've never really seen anybody talk about that. Um, yeah. Maybe I haven't spoken to enough people who live in New York, seeing as that's the size of their apartments. <laughs> I, I found the chart. I found the chart of the uh, sort of. Um, control sound soundcontrolrooms.com and it's like a chart with ratios and basically what a stupid domain name how yeah. obvious is that so width from 1 to 2 and height from 1.2 to 2.6 and it kind of gives like a little area where you want to stay within roughly uh, looks like it we're, probably we're talking meters I'm, I'm assuming I well it, it doesn't matter it's just a ratio so oh, yeah, it doesn't you. matter yeah, yeah. yeah it doesn't matter I get you. Uh, by the way, you know, nothing in America unless it's, you know, the medical industry is metric. Yeah, there you go. this is true. It's, it, took me, it took me like 10 years to get used to it. And now I'm at the point where every time I go back to Australia, I have to get used to metric again. And feel- <laughs> <laughs> just well, as a, a footnote to this, though, I would, would just say that uh, from my experience, having a, a teenage daughter that does voiceovers, uh, the microphone I prefer to use with her is actually a Rode and it's the NTG3. It's a good microphone, that. Yeah, and it's perfect for her voice. It just takes away the the sort of top end, the harshness at the top, and actually gives it a nice bit of um, bit of warmth. Add studio rack and a nice compressor and an EQ, and she'll sound perfect. There you go. Yes, indeed. And today, my <laughs> missus is on an NTG four. So uh, there you go. She does her voice, and I'm on an NTG four. Right now, there you go. Ah, I'm on a five. Are you using your NTG five? Yeah, where's your five? I'm. I'm not. I'm. I'm. I'm with my lovely TRRS cable and my laptop. Uh-huh. The, the super fast uh-huh. setup. That Even I though you so have much. an AI one, what's going on? That I I'm, feel. I'm. I'm not like. I'm just like pull stuff out of my bag, plug in. Okay. Oh, okay. We're on. <laughs> <laughs> I feel. I feel total. I feel totally uh, old fashioned. I mean, I'm using a uh, a blue microphones Yeti caster right now. Oh. oh. Sacrilege. Okay, I like cool. it. I like this. I like this, Mike. Well, I hope. I think we've answered Colin's question. Have we? I think so. No, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> Not at all. No. Not Thanks at for all. the question, though. Colin. Basically, what we did, what we did was, we've told Colin what he's doing wrong, and we tried to answer his question. But it's, uh, it's a damn good question. It is a good question, isn't it? And and that really struck me at the time. But. Speaking of questions, George, you're asking a few questions of your own before we go. Is that right? Ooh, I like that transition. Do you like that? I worked hard on that one. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, well, years ago, I used to offer up um, video on demand tutorials where you go to the site and find topics you're interested in and purchase the tutorial. Um, That got, I I still have those original videos on the site for free because they're quite old. I think they've had their 11th anniversary. Wow. (laughs) At least. Wow. But thankfully, they're Twisted Wave, which just hasn't changed all that much. Yeah. But there is a lot of new features in Twisted Wave. So beyond Twisted Wave, I'm looking for people's suggestion on what software they'd like to learn video tutorials on, on which softwares, which plugins, uh, what engineering techniques, what communication and remote production techniques and systems you, you want, need to learn, um, what hardware you know, Apollo, Roadcaster, blah, blah, blah. Mm. And and then like different techniques for webcasting, podcasting, live streaming. Yeah. I have a pretty wide array of knowledge from, you know, these years of doing all this stuff. And I thought, let's reach out and see what's popular. So if you do want to suggest stuff, I created a survey and it's right on my homepage. Just go to georgethe.tech. 
George the dot tech. Um, and uh, you can find it on there and submit your response. It'll and it'll also enter you into an obviously into an email ma- email list. But that's uh, that'll let me let you know when it's available when I actually get to make that content. Yeah, cool. So what I'll probably be doing is looking at the responses and just seeing what is the hottest topics. And I can tell you what's trending right now is Adobe Audition by far number one. Really, um, isn't that interesting? Yeah, Audacity wow. second. Yeah. And Twisted Wave third. And then in plugins, RX I, Isotope RX standard is definitely the number one yeah, thing people are wanting that. to learn about. No surprise. Yeah, yeah. And people want to learn about dynamics and equalization. Of course, they want to, you know, those are anything engineering. People are like, I don't understand any of this. Please teach me. Mm. And um, and then Source Connect standard is the one people want to know the most about for remote production. So you can put your two cents in. And hopefully I'll get that into my production queue. I try, I'm try. i going to try to make that a weekly thing where I block out time and produce a, a video a week. Don't hold me to it yet, but <laughs> hopefully get a video out a week and uh, put those up for sale. I'm, I might use Vimeo or something. They have a Vimeo Pro where I can sell them. So, um, yeah, so stay tuned. Just head to georgethe.tech, fill out the little form on the homepage, and uh, be part of that part of that process. And I'd really, really appreciate it. I'm there now and I can't find one on SM7s. What's going on? Well, I have a field called, what did I miss? <laughs> and you can type in whatever you want. Uh, you can also add it to any of the, like the hardware one, you could have one called SM7. Well, you know, so, you could go with today's topic. You, you obviously now need to do one that's about female rec- recording female voices, George. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, I've tried to think of as many topics as I can, but this is why I made this because I want your... Your your input on some some things I hadn't considered, and there you uh, go. so please yeah please please do uh, contribute. Thank you, and I'll, I will somehow add that to. I will fill out my own survey and put that in there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the time. I appreciate the time for the plug. No worries. We love a plug. This show was mixed by Voodoo Radio Imaging. Edit by Andrew Peters. Using Rode microphones and Source Connect Now. Tech support from George the Tech Whittem. And supported by Harlan Hogan's VoiceOverEssentials.com. The home of the Portabooth Pro. Yeah.